The Mexican journalist was sent an eye calendar invite. This triggered the standard chain where the Apple push notification service delivered a message and routed it to an iOS process, which caused it to sync with the iCloud calendar server, which connects with the URLs of the calendar invite sender, and then supplies the iOS process with the ICS file data. What was unique was that opening and closing character data tags were embedded in the ICS file's keys. Character data tags are normally used in XML documents to define a block of text that should be treated as text rather than as markup. These character data tags contain malicious code that was likely processed by iOS commanding the phone to download the spyware. This was a zero-click exploit that exploited an unknown vulnerability in iOS. Since the calendar invite was backdated, the iPhone automatically processed it and added it to the user's calendar without any notification. So there was nothing suspicious that could alert the user. This is based on an investigation by Citizen Lab and Microsoft of infected devices with suspicious calendar event artifacts in the calendar SQL Lite and also the iCloud calendar. The spyware consists of two agents. The main agent is a native Maco executable file. It's written in Go likely because of the language's cross OS functionality, suggesting there may be an Android variant. The spyware file has the same name as a legitimate iOS executable. The payload is Zor obfuscated. Once installed, it gained kernel access, escaped the iOS sandbox, bypassed the Apple mobile file integrity functions, and circumvented the PMAP mechanisms that works with the page protection layer to prevent unsigned code from running on iOS devices. Then the spyware started searching and retrieving files, querying SQL databases on the phone, and accessing the iOS keychain, which autofills save information in Safari and apps like usernames, passwords, passkeys, credit card information, and security codes. In addition to accessing location services, it can even use the camera and microphone in the background without the green and orange dots appearing or asking for permission. This is likely done by injecting a malicious thread into iOS's legitimate voice trigger framework which continuously monitors the user's voice to activate when it hears, hey Siri. Camera access is likely obtained by injecting a malicious thread into the accessibility switch control function that constantly uses the camera to detect the movement of the user's head to interact with the device for unlocking the phone. The spyware then uses its kernel access to hook and kill the daemons responsible for preventing processes from accessing the camera and microphone. The spyware exfiltrates data via HTTPS POST requests to its servers hosted on cheap cloud hosting providers. The HTTPS was set up on the servers using Freelet's Encrypt SSL certificates, while others use self-signed Kubernetes certificates likely to blend in with normal Kubernetes deployments. The hosting providers apparently accept cryptocurrency as payment to possibly protect hosting anonymity. While all of this was going on, the other spyware agent, which is a native Maco executable file written in Objective-C, was covering the forensic footprint. It was managing and monitoring spyware processes that were spawned and adding the process IDs to a tracking list. Then when the processes were done being used, the spyware agent used a system call to see if the process was reachable and then sent a sickle command to kill it. This avoided using other kill commands that could have left error messages and artifacts behind. The spyware agent also monitored the directories for any malware execution artifacts and or crash-related files and deleted them. Finally, when the spyware operators were finished spying, they sent a special cleanup command from the spyware's command and control server. It searched the SQLite database and catches, enumerating two years worth of calendar events and then checked for the email address used with the zero-click exploit calendar invite and then deleted any events associated with it. Then finally, it deleted the two spyware agents, although with any program, some artifacts are impossible to remove. When the spyware first connected with one of the spyware command and control servers, it looked up the domain through the ISP's DNS recursive server, which logs all the information from those DNS records, including domains, IP addresses, and certificate data. From these records, they can start correlating related domain names, IP addresses, and start compiling unique characteristics of the spyware infrastructure to create a unique fingerprint. They can also create a separate fingerprint of the digital signature and the server's self-signed certificates. Between scanning the internet for these fingerprints and correlating related passive DNS records, they identified likely spyware operators' infrastructure in these countries. This is Quadream Spyware, the low-price competitor to NSO Group's Pegasus Spyware. They are an Israeli-based spyware development company that sells to governments and possibly private organizations through a Cyprus-based distributor called InReach. Because they sell out of Cyprus and not Israel, they are not subject to Israel's Defense Ministry export licensing laws. According to public legal documents, InReach was set up solely to resell Quadream spyware out of Cyprus. 
It is also speculated that they sell access as a service. Quadream is very secretive. It has no website, employees do not put it on LinkedIn, and there is little public reporting about the company. But because of a lawsuit that broke out between the two companies over possible hiding of revenues, information about the company was thrusted into the public domain. After Microsoft and Citizen Labs reports the company is reportedly shutting down and selling off their intellectual property, these reports may have been the straw that broke the camel's back.